being thankful to the Lord. It's what we're told to do in Scripture. But sometimes when we read a Scripture, we don't read it all the way through. So I want you to look at Philippians 4, 6. It says, be anxious. And we go, see right there. It's okay. Be anxious. The Bible says be anxious. You got to read the whole thing. <laughs> it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. I'm going to break this down because I'm talking about what is the acceptable sacrifice? How do we approach God and how can we be thankful? I'm going to explain that to you tonight, today. It says, be anxious. Let's, first, let's break that down. Anxiety or anxiousness means to take thought or to divide. So being anxious is you take a thought. And by the way, there are 60 to 80,000 thoughts going through your brain every day. Now, if you don't take hold of those things and just go with it, that's a lot of influence in your life. And probably it's about what you're not. Because it's there's a lot of energy and negativity, and and if you let the enemy get in there, he'll give you sixty to eighty thousand thoughts of how terrible you are. Yeah. So that's why it takes every thought captive under the obedience of Jesus Christ. That's that's the gift we've been given. But here it says, "Be anxious," and the word comes from anxiety. The word anxiety. This is how it's translated: a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. You're about ready to go into Thanksgiving, and you got to make sure that Aunt Pearl and Aunt June don't sit next to each other. <laughs> and of course, we got Weird Uncle Al. Sorry, Al. Hey, always use Weird Uncle Al. Sorry, buddy. But Weird Uncle Al, you got to play. Put him somewhere. You want to put him with the kids' table, but the kids would freak out, so we can't put him there. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the turkey and the green bean casserole. Who's going to bring that? Oh, is that going to? And that, you know, cousin so and so, he brings a pie, but he just buys it at Kroger's or whatever. That Reese's, who brings a Reese's? You should be able to make it. For, okay, we got all this stuff going on. <laughs> be anxious for nothing. And here's the thing. Jesus said, in this world, you're going to you're gonna confront trials of many kinds. So it's not, that, it's not like trials aren't going to come into your life. It's when they do, how do you respond and not react? How do you respond by the Spirit? And that's the whole idea. So be anxious for nothing. And this word nothing, it actually means not even one, not at all, without delay. So when you get hit with something, which we all will get hit with stuff to be anxious about, then we, we stop without delay, get there quick to say, nope, it's not going to steal my joy. It's not going to steal my life. <sighs> Take a breather, Right? Now, look, look what Paul says, be anxious for nothing but in everything, implying there's going to be things that come into your life. There's going to be things that you have no control over, but you do have control over how you respond to it or react to it. That's what you have control over. So whenever things happen to your life that you didn't see, come, well, how, what's going on? Realize that heaven's, heaven's cool. You'll never see, you'll never hear from heaven, oops. I want you to think about that. Never will you hear like, God, how did that happen? That's never, you're never going to hear that from your father. He's got it all under control, right? And sometimes out of those 60 to 80,000 thoughts, <coughs> you got to think that one through a couple of times, <coughs> that God is in control. That takes effort. That's, that's the faith walk. Lord, I can't see it, but I know that, that you're working on all things, and I bring everything I'm anxious about nothing, about nothing. And in everything, I trust you. In all, without delay, I trust you. In everything, in the whole, everything. That's what it means. Now, here's the next part. So, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer. Now, this by prayer translation in the Greek seem, seems to be like, Orlando, come on, really, you have to say that. Yeah, Paul had to say this. What this word prayer means, it means addressed to God. Well, of course, every prayer is addressed to God. <laughs> not really. Not sometimes. Let me, let me show you how some of us pray. God, these are going terrible. I don't know what's happening in my life. Man, I just, my boss is terrible. My life is terrible. My kids are terrible. Amen. <laughs> see, see that, that, that's not a prayer. <laughs> see, that's why it says in all things, in everything, be, you know, to bring your prayers to God, which implies You've kind of thought it through, and now you're actually making a request and not a complaint. See, th there's not a complaint box in heaven. It's a prayer. He's listening for your prayers. Can, can you articulate? Can you put together? Can you get beyond the feelings? Can you go beyond the thought uh, of not fair? Can you go and actually present a prayer? 
to God. That's what it's saying. And, and Paul has to say that because we'll go off and go, this is my prayer to God. No, you're, you're just complaining. Just make sure you understand what whining and complaining and a prayer is just different. It's just different. So a prayer to God and supplication. I love this word supplication. It means a seeking and asking and entreating about your wants and your needs. Now, here's the deal. When I grew up in my church, my church is a fairly legalistic church, and here's what I heard. I, it wasn't, I don't know where, maybe it was more caught than taught, but this was what I, my perception was. My perception was that God, God will meet your needs, but he won't address your wants. He, he's not going to meet your wants, but he'll meet your needs. And everyone says, that sounds so religious. I believe that too. <laughs> he wants me to suffer. He wants me to somehow prove and I'm going to suffer because he's just going to meet my needs, but he's not going to meet my wants. And by the way, when the Bible says he wants to give you the desires of your heart, that is code for your wants. <laughs> the desires of your heart are your wants. <laughs> What's in your heart? Do you realize that God knows what the desires of your heart is anyway? So, so he, here's what's important. Here's what's important. T to make supplication means to seek, to ask, to entreat, for my needs and my wants. And here's the thing. If you have a want deep in your heart and you never articulate it, you never get it out into the atmosphere to be, to be judged. Okay, like for instance, if I said, Lord, I really want a 12,000 square foot house. Man, I just need to have a 12,000 square. Well, my daughter's about ready to graduate college. We're about ready to be empty nesters. 12,000 square feet for two people? But that's what I want. Now, unless I articulate that, I can't judge it whether it's just, you know, bad pizza or it's really God, right? Well, you know, <laughs> so, but you have, you, you, you need to realize that God already knows the desires of your heart and it's important to say it. And when you say it, you can judge it. What do you think, church? It's important to be honest with your father. And don't play that whole, you know, kind of like, Super spiritual. Well, I'm just an old shoe God. Don't I don't worry about me. I, I don't I just be helpful. I just thankful for whatever you want. Throw all the crumbs off the table, God. I'm happy for. And you're going, man, I hope he doesn't give me the crumbs off the table. <laughs> he knows the desires of your heart. Ask. And by the way, he is concerned about your wants and your needs. Gotta leave that. Take that out. He's concerned about what concerns you. So by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, I love this thanksgiving. It means being actively grateful because you're favored. Everyone say, I'm God's favorite. Now say it like you mean it. I'm God's favorite. Yes, you are. We're all God's favorite. Think of it this way. If my father owned Walmart and I walked into Walmart, and I'm the son of the guy that owns Walmart, they're going to know, hey, that's Rolando. He's the son of the guy that owns Walmart. I walk in, and I want to take a banana and eat it. He's favored. I want to open up a jar of pickles and start eating that too. He's favored. And that's, I know, we, I know, bananas, pickles. I just can't, I couldn't think of anything else. Anyway, so I'm just saying, <laughs> there's favor because of who you are. Y'all, there's favor in your life because who you belong to and who you are. Your favor, therefore, I make my supplication before God with thanksgiving. How do I do that? Lord, this is how I do it. Lord, I don't have enough money, but I thank you in advance that you're preparing things for my life. Thank you that you're preparing me to receive it in Jesus' name. I thank you for favor in my life, and thank you for prosperity coming to me. It is not about the stuff. It's not about materialism. It's about an attitude of knowing who you are. That changes everything. I got a pain in my back. Oh, man, it, it could, yeah. no, Lord, I thank you, God, that by your stripes I'm healed. And so, therefore, I thank you in advance for healing my back in Jesus' name. This is how we pray. We pray with an, with an idea of thanksgiving. We pray because we're favored of the Lord. Okay, so with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests, a thing asked or petition, it's okay to request, to ask God. So with thanksgiving, with prayer to God, not complaints to God, make your petition to God. It's okay to ask. <clears throat> and it says here, be made known to God. Now this be made known unto God translates to certify, declare. It's like a certified letter. And this is what I would, I, I would like for you to get in the habit of. Remember when you used to do journaling, journaling? 
The guys did journaling. The women did diaries. Remember that back in the day? Here's the thing. If, if you're going through a struggle and you cannot write down what you expect or what you want, then it's, it's just you're not, you're not serious about wanting out of the situation. If you can't write down, if you can't say, in my marriage, this is what I expect. This is what I pray for. And this is what I'm thankful to you that you're going to give me in Jesus' name. And you can't write it down. But all you say, he's no good. I can't believe she doesn't get up in the morning and get me coffee. I, whatever, you know, whatever it might be. And you're just complaining, right? That's, that's not, you have to be able to, to your prayer has got to be almost a, like a certified letter that you've brought, you've thought through it. And this is exactly what I'm saying, God. Remember the guy in the pool of Bethesda, right? Jesus comes to him. He sees that he's struggling. He's been there for 30 some odd years. We find that in that explanation. Jesus comes to him and says, hey, buddy. Would you want to be healed? And the guy says, I may, if only I could. <laughs> and then for the next several verses, let me tell you why I can't. Let me just tell you, gee, why I can't be healed. The water gets stirred. If I, I try to jump in, nobody helps me. And I'm sitting over here. I've been here for 30 some odd years and nobody helps me. And the water gets stirred. And that's why I can't. And it's probably never going to happen. And I'm just sitting here. And Jesus goes, boy, yeah, like. Hey, and, and, and the attitude or, or the way the Greek kind of explains the words he says, it's like a coach would say, hey, get up, get up and take your cart and go home, your mat or whatever. You, and the idea was, how can you be, th you know, think about the Savior, the Creator, the Messiah asks you, do you want to be healed? And then you go off telling him why it's not possible. That's not far removed from what we do, huh? You've heard me say this before. When the Savior says, do you want to be healed? Your response should be, yes. yes. <laughs> Would you like prosperity? The answer should be, yes. think, think of it this way about prosperity, y'all. Uh, uh, Solomon, chapter 3 of 1 Kings, he says, uh, Lord, uh, God says, I wanna, I'm going to answer your prayer. So he says, well, you know what, Lord, I need wisdom. And then the Father says, because you ask not for riches and wealth, I'm going to throw that in there as well. Right? Here's the thing. Was Solomon already wealthy? Yes, he was. It doesn't, money doesn't make God nervous. He wants to bless his children. Because you ask not for wealth and riches, I'm going to throw it in there just, just because I love you. That's the heartbeat of your father. And again, it's not about materialism. It's realizing who you are. You are a favored child. And we're supposed to not be anxious. We're supposed to be making every request with supplication, with prayer, with thanksgiving. That's the acceptable sacrifice, with thanksgiving. So with that in mind, look, look at the, the results of coming to God, God's way, praying to God, God's way. Look at verse seven. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. Is that the awesome thing? Now, here's the thing. If it said, and the peace of Orlando, you go, well, is that a cup full? Is that like, what is that? Or the peace of Jaime, probably two cups full, you know, Pastor Jaime. But this is the peace of God. God kind of peace that will surpass all the thoughts and processes of your mind. It's a God kind of peace that comes upon you. I think it's worth trying, y'all. What do you think? That's good, isn't it? That's good to know about the Lord. So I'm going to, you know, I love looking at the Old Covenant and, and the Old Testament. And I find something that, that's, and when you read the Old Testament, you find symbolism and, and you find Jesus, really. So I'm going to show you something that I, I, I read here in Leviticus 5 about how they dealt with trespass offerings. And chapter 5 deals with uh, a, a trespass that you weren't really made aware of. Like, for instance, you were walking along and there was a dead carcass and somehow you brushed against it. And if you touch a dead carcass, you become unclean. And maybe throughout the day or the week, you, you've been you know, going through your life and all of a sudden you think, you know what, did I, and did I rub against that thing? And this is when you become aware, when you, uh, something happened and you realize, I messed up, I need to go back and fix that. Then this is the trespass offering you bring. Or if you made an oath, someone said, hey, will you do this for me? He said, and, and automatically you said, oh yeah, I'll be glad to cover that for you. I'll, 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 I'll do that for you. And you realize you're gonna be out of town that week. You go, oh man, I, I agree to something that I can't fulfill. That's a trespass offering. Like it's not a huge, you didn't kill somebody. That, that's a different, this is a, like you're not really sure. Or, or, or when you saw something happen and, and you didn't tell a lie, but you didn't tell, 
you didn't you didn't become a witness. You saw something an, an injustice, and and you you didn't you didn't step up. And so that these things are kind of like ah, you kind of missed it. That's that's what this is. And it says this when you become aware. Look at verse five. It says when you become aware of your guilt in any of these ways, you must confess uh, your sin. And the word confess is a praise word that we use. The word confess is yada. Yada. And it means to lift up your hands and shoot away or cast. What does that mean? That means when I come before the presence of the Lord and I realize I messed up, I lift up my hands and I cast away that identity and I get back the identity of being a child of Jehovah. So that's great symbolism of how we come to worship the Lord. We come and we confess. What are we, what are we confessing? We're saying, Lord, I thank you that scriptural confession is I lift up my hands and I yada, I cast away that identity. And I, I say what you say that I am, that I am free from that. And then I get busy. The next verses, man, it says, and get busy with redemption. The next several verses says, when you realize that you've been guilty of something, confess, yada, lift up your hands, cast away, and then get busy with redemption. Religion wants you to get busy with self-condemnation. Like when you've figured out you've done something wrong, you better get up here, you better cry, and you better be feel bad for three or four days to prove to God that you're really serious about your redemption. And here's the problem with that. If, I, if any goodness could come up from my doing something to make God feel good about me, then Jesus came and died for no reason at all. So the idea is when, when look, verse five, when you become aware, like when you become aware uh, of your guilt, and by the way, y'all, uh, there is something about realizing that you need a savior to find a savior. And there's something about realizing you need a redeemer to find a redeemer. I know it sounds real like elementary, but when the Holy Spirit says you need a comforter and you go, no, no, I'm fine. Everything's good. I'm good. No, really, I'm, I'm just fine. You need to come to him needing. We need help in times of our need. And God wants you to come to him. And that's why when you become aware that it's time to come to Jesus, get over yourself, lift up your hands, cast away that, uh, that thing, that whatever the enemy will try to tell you that you are, that you're not, cast that away and then get go to find the lamb. That's exactly what happened next. The next several verses, it was like, uh, verse 6 talks about finding a female lamb or a goat. And the idea is get busy with finding the redemption. And, and if you couldn't afford the lamb, then, then, then go get a pigeon or a dove. you can't afford a pigeon or a dove, then get some flour. Okay, so that's important to realize. Bring a sacrifice to the Lord. This is an old covenant concept. But it, it has a, a symbolism of how we're supposed to bring a sacrifice. So I want to show you this real quick. Um, Look at uh, the tabernacle of Moses, if you will. This tabernacle of Moses, there was an entryway. See the entryway there at, the, at the, the bottom over here? That was the entryway. So let's say I finally acknowledge that I need a savior, that I need saving, that I need redeeming. So I go get the right sacrifice, the lamb or, or the, the, the dove or, or even the, um, the, um, the flower. And I turn the corner and I walk into the holy or the, uh, the, the outer court. This is the, the temple. This is the tabernacle of Moses, it's kind of a temple in the wilderness. And I walk in, and the first thing that I see when I walk in is the brazen altar. Y'all see the brazen altar? Now, that brazen altar is where fire is, and the idea is you walk in and you're approached to God. The very first thing, as you turn the corner to come into the presence of the Lord, the very first thing you see is the brazen altar, which is made of bronze, and bronze is about judgment. So you, you realize you've done something wrong, and you're going to bring the right sacrifice, and you bring the sacrifice, and you turn, and you see judgment. You said, absolutely right, and the judgment is not against you. It's against your sacrifice because you realize that you brought the right sacrifice. See, it's not about you. It's about the sacrifice, and the sacrifice is analyzed, not you. So like Jesus in Christ, we're in Christ, and Christ is evaluated, not us. And we're in Christ, whole, complete, lacking nothing. And we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's who you are. Okay, so we turn the corner, and we go, here's my sacrifice, and the, 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 the priest will take your sacrifice, prepare it, and burn it. Okay, but look at the process we go through. Not only is there the brazen altar, there's the in the outer court area. There's also the labor. So the priest goes and washes his hands in the labor, 
uh, and then goes into the holy place. In the holy place, we have the candlestick, table of showbread, and the golden altar, or the, uh, the altar of incense, which implies symbolically that Jesus wants to meet uh, your, your needs by the bread. He wants to guide your life by the light, and he wants to be an intercessor. He's, he's ever uh, uh, advocating for you, praying for you. Isn't that call, cool symbolism? So there's the, there, there's the holy place. And then, and then you have to, one step further, you have the holy of holies. Now, in the holy of holies is where the Ark of the Covenant is. You all with me? Are you all with me? Yeah. Ark of the Covenant is made of gold, and it represents the very presence of God. And only one priest once a year was able to walk into this place. Very holy place. All right, everybody with me so far? Now stay with me. I'm going someplace. So, so now, now we see this. Now the brazen altar is about judgment. Look at Leviticus 17, 11. It says, uh, for, the, for the life of the blood, for, for the life of the blood, the body is in the blood. I have given you the blood on the altar to purify you. Now the word purify in some translations actually means to atone, to atone for yourself, to atone for yourself, making you right with the Lord, to atone for the sin and making you right for the Lord. The word atonement in this particular uh, Hebrew implies covering, to cover, and you are covered for a year. In Christ, we're covered for a lifetime because he didn't just cover your sin, he took it away. A big difference between old covenant and new covenant. He didn't cover your sin, he took it away. Isn't that cool? And my confession is, thank you, Lord, for what you've done. I lift up my hands. I say, that's not my identity. The enemy's telling me how terrible I am. My identity is I'm free in Christ. Thank you, Father. I proclaim that. Come on, church. This is, this is how we live. Grateful, grateful, great. Okay, so we keep going. So now, so, so this idea of, of the tabernacle of Moses is really important to understand. But, I, but you have to understand there was a switch. Something happened. Something changed under the tabernacle of David. Let me show the tabernacle of David. You go right into the tabernacle, and you pass the doorkeepers, and the first thing you see is the Ark of the Covenant. There is no labor. There is no holy place. Only the holy of holies awaits, with, waits, you, waits for you out of the tabernacle of David. So get the picture. You, you realize you've done something wrong, and you get the right sacrifice, and you come in, and you turn the corner to walk into the gates, and as you walk into the gates, the doorkeeper says, come on in. And as you walk in, you're ready to lay down your, 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 your sacrifice, blood sacrifice, it's got to be something. And then someone says, oh, no, no, no. Here's the presence of the Lord. Well, what's the right sacrifice? And David says, it's you. You're the acceptable sacrifice. Well, what do I bring? Thanksgiving. <laughs> Isn't this awesome? You're the acceptable. I want you to see what he said here. He said this over here. Um, no, let me keep going. So let me, let me show you the Ark of the Covenant real quick. That's what you see. Made of gold, purity, perfection. You have access to the Father. When you turn the corner thinking that I got to pay for something in the tabernacle of David, it's access to the Father. Direct access to the Father. There are no articles. They've been moved out of the way. You come right into the Holy of Holies. It's an old covenant image of what the new covenant did for us. Tabernacle of Moses represents the law. Tabernacle of David represents his grace. What do you think, church? David had a revelation of the grace of God. Look at this in Psalm 40, verse 6 and 7. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offerings you did not require. So, I did it the old-fashioned way. I tried bringing these things, but I have a relationship with my father that seems to go so far beyond, which is exactly what father wanted all along. Not for you to be caught up with the sacrifices, but realize the sacrifices lets you approach a holy God. Isaiah chapter 1, God is bring, bringing a major rebuke against his people because they've elevated the sacrifices above God. And David is saying, you know, I tried that, and it didn't seem to work for me. I, I, I don't get it. And the next verse explains... He says, then I said, behold, I come. And the scroll of the book is written about me. Then Psalm 51, verse 17, a broken and contrite heart God will not despise. So I'm the sacrifice that's accepted. I realize I'm serving and honoring God. And that's a place of brokenness. And when I see the very image of God, I'm going, 
I have access to the Father. Thank you. Sacrifice of thanksgiving. What do you think, church? Isn't that awesome? So let me explain to you that for the, in First Chronicles 16, in First Chronicles 16, David sets up the tabernacle. This is the first church service under this new idea. All right, and this is what he does. Look at verse four. And he appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord. Okay, now check that out. The ministry that's happening under the tabernacle of David is not ministering for the people, it's ministering to the Lord. And the Lord is saying, if I am lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Come unto me, all that are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. And as you minister to the Lord, your needs get met. As you magnify him, your needs get met. That's why I've always said, when you come to church, you do not come to church to get a blessing. You come to church to bless God. And when you bless God, you're blessed. Everything changes because once again, your attention is not on you. Your attention is on him, and everything changes. So he says here, and he appointed certain Levites to minister before the ark of the Lord and to record and to thank and praise the Lord God of Israel. Let me break this down. And, and to, be, to minister before the ark of the Lord, to record. Now this word record means to remember, recall, or call to mind. So as we enter the gates, these doors, you're walking in and you're thinking about the goodness of God. And that's why we have songs that talk about the goodness of God, the greatness of God, what he's done for you in the past and how great he is. So you're caught up with today's struggle and God is saying, wait, take, take, just take a minute and remember what I brought you out of. Remember where you were a year ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, five years ago. Remember where you are today. Rejoice. That's what we have to do. We have to be, mo we have to aggressively remember. This is what God has done because the enemy is aggressively causing you to forget and get caught up with what's going on today. So you have an opportunity to come into his presence and remember the goodness of God. That, so we have songs that cause us to remember the goodness of God. That would be, um, that's what we do and record. Now it says to record and to thank. The word thank again is yada, the word that was used for confession. What does that mean? That means that my lifting up my hands is yada, lift up your hands and cast away. As I lift up my hands and I cast away, I'm confessing what God says about me. I spend more time bragging about what God says about me than putting myself down on what I'm not doing right. And as I magnify what God says about me, I am carried into the very presence of God myself because I'm the acceptable sacrifice. Come on, church. This is good stuff. So, so to record and to thank Yada, lift up your hands, cast away that former identity and be still. Okay, then, and to praise, okay? This to praise is a great word. It's halal. Where we get the word hallelujah. And we think hallelujah is a very somber and solemn word. Remember, I don't know if you ever watched uh, Benny Hinn uh, when he was back in the day. And he would go, hallelujah, come on, choir, sing for me. Hallelujah. And you think, bro, really quit singing. Don't, you're killing me here. <laughs> it was never meant to be. The word hallelujah comes from the word halal, and halal means to be clamorously foolish and just crazy about God. It actually translates to, to, to show, to make a show, to boast, to rave, to be clamorously foolish. That you get so overwhelmed with God, you get happy. We call it getting happy. Woo, man, God is good. And you just can't contain yourself. That's okay. That's acceptable. And God says, acceptable worship, praise the Lord. Lifting up your hands, yes, acceptable. Not waiting for a moment. Not just, I'm going to come in and lift my, because I love it. Where if we're on, the right song, lift my hands. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm going to be proactive in this thing. And even when things are going crazy, I will praise him. It's a great story. I think I have a few minutes here. David, surrounded by his enemy, in, in the very enemy's camp, the king of Akish, about ready to kill him. He's in the hometown yeah, about ready to be destroyed. They have their drawn, swords drawn, and it says he fainted himself, or he somehow he fainted. He pretended to be mad. You all know the story? The word mad translates to halal. If I'm going down, I'm going down. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Woo! God, you're so good. It freaked everybody out. The guy was praising God like a crazy man. They said, hey, do I need any more crazy people? Get him out of here. Salvation came when you went counterintuitive to what's going on around you. And you began to worship and not moan and groan. You say, man, I'm going to praise it. 
If I'm going down, let's go down with happy in Jesus. And God will change everything. That's the God we serve, church. And God looks down and says, acceptable. This is good. It's, it's good. Makes me happy. You know what I'm saying? So, so this idea of running to the Lord, coming to him. So, so how does it apply to us? I'm glad you asked that question. Look at Psalm 100, verse 4. It says here, again, more encouragement of coming in. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving to the Lord. What does that mean? Okay, let's break it down. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. This is another word of praise that actually involves lifting up your hands. Before it was yada, lifting up your hands and shooting, casting away that identity that isn't yours, lifting up your hands and confessing what God says about you. That's what I do when I lift up my hands. This is the word toda. Okay, look at this, which means extension of the hands, confess, praise, thanksgiving for things not yet received. So, Lord, I, lift up, I thank you, Father God, that my family will serve you in all their ways. Thank you, Father God. It's not what I see, but it's what I'm praying right now. Thank you, Father. In advance, I lift up my hands to you. I thank you, God, that I'm prosperous. I have money. I have the ability to, to, to promote gospel, the gospel wherever it can go. God, thank you for that, for that, in Jesus' name. Thank you for my healing, Lord. I just thank you in advance right now. Toda. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Toda. Enter his courts with praise. This word praise is the healer. The healer. The guy missed it by that much. He was close. He was close. <laughs> to Tehila to healer is a hymn of praise. As you come into the presence of the Lord and you begin to love him and lift up your hands and yaw to the Lord as I cast away the identity that the enemy's trying to you know, put on me or I lift up my hands and I thank him in advance for the things that I don't, I don't have yet, but I just want to thank you, Father, for that thing. And then I, I come to this. This is a place of intimate worship with a hymn. And the hymn isn't just like hymns that we sing. It's something that's deep in your heart. Like when you're quiet before the Lord, an old song, it could be as like, Jesus loves me, this I know. And that's just... It takes you someplace or amazing grace. It's just you and Jesus. It's that him that's deep in the recesses of your heart that only you and him share. It's that him of praise. And there are certain psalms that have been put together in, in the process of the Jewish faith that they would sing these psalms when they were young. And this, is, this became their expression. When, when Paul was in jail, he sang certain songs, uh, certain hymns, and it was the Psalms of Ascension. The, the great halal is what he sang in jail. Because it was so deep. It's what I, I just what I know. It's what's in my heart. It's that hymn of intimacy. So to heal of the Lord, songs of hymns uh, of praise. To be thankful, to be thankful. To be thankful is yada. Here we go again. Shooting, getting away from that stuff. Unto him and bless his name. The word bless is Barak, which means to bow down. And this, this is what a, a, the church is supposed to be about. You walk into these gates with an expectation of meeting the Father, and you've come prepared, and you give him because you're the acceptable sacrifice. You lift up your hands. You love him. You cast away. You receive from him the things that you need. And as you walk with him with intimacy, as we go through the praise and worship, it comes a time where it's just you want to just be with him. Just you bowed knee to your Savior. This is a service. Acceptable. What do you think, church? Why is this so important? And again, I'm so glad you asked that question. Amos 9:11. In that day, I'll restore the fallen house of David. This actually translates, I'll restore the tabernacle of David. In what days? In the days the Messiah comes, in the time that Jesus shows up. In that day, I'll restore the fallen house of David. I'll repair its damaged walls from the ruins. I will rebuild it and restore the former glory. This is about praise and worship. What we experience today is a Fulfillment of prophecy, the restoration of the tabernacle of David, the fact they were able to walk in into the very presence, into the very holy of holies of God. When Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, the veil that separated the holy of holies to, for everybody else was torn from the top to the bottom, saying, come on in, come into my presence. The restoration of the tabernacle of David we're experiencing right now, you are the fulfillment of prophecy. Isn't that awesome? And I want you to see, this is what's amazing. It's not the tabernacle of Moses. We cannot be under this great covenant of Jesus Christ and fall back to an old covenant approach, which is the covenant of Moses, rules and regulations. 
The covenant of Moses represents the law. The covenant of David represents his grace. As you magnify who he is. In Acts uh, 15, 16, afterwards, I'll return and restore the fallen house of David. Again, restoring the tabernacle of David. I'll rebuild its ruins and restore it. And because we're, we're in this place of a beautiful relationship and connection with God, that, our, that we are the acceptable sacrifice, that we bring lifted, lifted hands with thanksgiving before the Father, with a proactive approach to everything we face, knowing we're the favorite of the Lord. It's how we live. Then, then all of a sudden, Hebrews 4.16 comes alive. So let us come boldly to the throne room of our gracious God. There we'll receive his mercy and we'll find grace to help us when we need it the most. And when you need it the most is when you feel you failed the most. When you feel you've not measured up. That's when you need his grace and mercy. And that's when we run away from God. And God is saying, look, we have such a great relationship. When you feel like you're not measured up, come into me. Come boldly. Come on in. Because you're the acceptable sacrifice. Church, we're the acceptable sacrifice. And we're the fulfillment of this amazing prophecy. In this covenant, we are the acceptable sacrifice. We have been cleansed by Jesus' sacrifice. And we have a rightful place in our Father's presence. We come with joy and adoration boldly into the throne room of his grace. You are the acceptable sacrifice. Take your place. When you need it the most, come in. So we go back to Philippians 4, 8, and it says this. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. That word meditate, it actually is a great word. It means to calculate, think through. Don't just settle on emotion. Well, if they sing my song, I'll get emotional. If they sing the song I love, no, no. The idea is that you meditate, you calculate, and You've thought through it. You, you think through it. You think on these things. You purposely think on the goodness of God. And all the stuff I just laid out for you, if you can't find one thing to be thankful for, all the stuff I just said, it represents Jesus. Because he is pure, because he's beautiful, because he's holy. Take your rightful place. Sacrifice to the Lord. So I leave you with our tip. I tried for a week. This week, tried for a week. This week, I choose not to be anxious about anything. I present my concerns and needs to God with prayers of thanksgiving because I know God is for me. I live in God's peace and in the joy that that brings. What do you think, church? Best way to live, church. Not the tabernacle of Moses, tabernacle of David, face to face with God. Isn't that awesome? Let's pray. Father, I'm so grateful, Lord, to your word, the beauty of our salvation, the facets of your goodness as you keep pouring and pouring into our lives, your love. I thank you, God, that we're drawn to be more like you, understanding your grace, your goodness. Father, I pray right now that everyone has a vision that they're the acceptable sacrifice that the Father's calling face-to-face -face relationship with each one of us. And we come in surrendered in every area, not be distracted with the cares of this world. This is what you say that we are, and we embrace it. We're your children. We belong to you. So God, I pray you pour into the, these hearts, that missing piece, God. You pour into them, Lord God. I thank you that by the Spirit, they become aware of how much you love them. This is your day. This is your week, God. We trust in you. We go forth empowered, enriched. And we think the Holy Spirit would reveal more and more of your grace to us as we walk out our lives. And maybe someone here that never received Jesus, if, if you'll repeat this prayer of receiving Jesus as Lord with me, I would appreciate it. Father, and I call you my Father, thank you for Jesus. I receive him as Lord of my life. I will never be the same again. I belong to you, Father, and you belong to me. In Jesus' name, amen.